Welcome Achievers to Woo! August 10th episode something of these Achievers Game Podcast. I'm coming to you like I do every single Friday sometimes. And we're going to discuss some news. We're going to talk about a couple things today, a couple of rumors. This is rumor heavy and also light on the news. There's not really much concrete stuff to discuss today, so... It's really going to be uh, you and me chatting, discussing a couple things that I've heard around the block, some rumors, again, some speculation. And um, oh, what's the main story? Let's give you a sneak peek. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Nintendo, talk a little bit about backwards compatibility and these things, and a little game, Baldur's Gate 3. We're going to talk about that a little bit later, too. So I'm very excited to discuss this. I hope you are as well, and let's start. With not so rapid fire. Valve has begun selling refurbished Steam decks. I thought I saw this. Uh, I want to say it was yesterday. I, I see this. I'm going, well, that's smart, of course. Uh, eventually, uh, anything's going to be sold refurbished, I guess. But also, they're selling it on, of course, Steam. And also, I saw, I, th- I believe, GameStop is as well. Now, I don't know if they're buying them. But I know I saw them on the website. And they're being advertised that they're selling them. So you can keep a lookout. I saw one as low as, like, 319 I want to say. Something around there, so be on the lookout if that's something you're interested in. Call of Duty has finally showed their hand, kind of, as they are set to have a full reveal for the game on August 17th. And there's going to be a release, has already been set as well, for November 10th. So it looks like we're two months away, three months, sorry, three months away from seeing what uh, the full-fledged Call of Duty is on our consoles and We'll see the full reveal in the coming days, a week from today, actually, as of recording. Call of Duty is a special thing for me, as I always play them, but and the Modern Warfare is actually my favorite, but it's it's never something I'm like, like really, really excited for. You know, it's one of those things where it's kind of like um similar to football, where I'm always watching football, but it, you you get into the groove with it so much that like it's expected. You don't you know you're not really surprise when it comes around anything so it's it's just one of those things it's scheduled you know oh it's the schedule call of duty let's let's play it and of course uh this is the call of duty that was rumored to not be a full release but it seems that they put in all the stops to make it a full release it is call of duty modern warfare 3 of course it wasn't going to be that i believe something happened with i think oh my god who was it <clears throat> was it was this the year that raven was going to do a game but then something happened. They had to take it off. It's, it's something of that nature. Something bad happened. This was originally not going to have a Call of Duty. It's going to be like an expansion. But uh, they, they're now just going to try and pivot to a full-fledged, hey, it's Modern Warfare 3. I'm, very, I'm excited because I, I did like Modern Warfare 2. I know a lot of people didn't like it as much. But I did. I'm not super into the multi- Call of Duty multiplayer as much anymore as I usually go towards the Overwatches every now and then, the Apexes, although I haven't in a while. And, of course, my Destiny. So, excited to see more. Street Fighter 6 is getting Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle costumes for their creative characters. So, uh, people were a little upset because I believe the thing is like over 10 bucks to get the char- character. Hold on, let's see. TMNT Street Fighter 6. I-, I-, I remember people being upset because it's expensive. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah. So, so you don't have, you can't buy one set apparently, which is pretty outrageous, I believe. You have to buy them individually, and each one is $15. $15. $15 each one. So 15 times 4, you're paying almost as much as the game does. Very interesting move from them. I can't imagine it was actually that expensive to make these things, but maybe it was. I don't know. Uh, Maybe they're just testing the waters and seeing, like, well, how much can we charge for these things? Because that is technically in the realm of these free to play in quotes type games everyone thinks of fortnite where they're very expensive so some are 15 20 dollars for those skins but that of course is a free to play title street fighter 6 you pay a full price and then you have to do this so it's interesting that so close to release they're like hey by the way 15 dollars each skin boom you know that's how much it's gonna cost interesting move from them that's it for not so rapid fire this week there wasn't again too much to discuss so we're gonna get into what have you been playing playing of course this is a question i ask you at home what have you been playing is it something that you're really excited about are you in between games i know a lot of people are actually out there talking about Baldur's gate 3 and we're going to be talking about that in a little bit 
more deeply as I have not been playing it, but I'm seeing a lot of interesting discussions around Baldur's Gate 3, which is something I find more and more get me worried about another title. But I have been finishing Final Fantasy 16. I've actually finished Final Fantasy 16, and it is a great time. I want to say a fantastic time, actually. I had a great time with Final Fantasy 16, although I, I will say I do not share the praise that many other people had for this title. Uh, I know a lot of people were like kind of in love with Final Fantasy 16. I love it quite much, um, but I have plenty, 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 plenty of problems with the game. Some with the combat, especially early on. Not, but as you develop the game more and more, it, it gets more fun. But uh, you know, the gear, the lack of a party wasn't great. You know, there's a lot of little things like that. The story kind of in the end turns into something interesting. Of course, I won't spoil it here, but I enjoy the game. I definitely think it's worth the money. But you have to know what you're getting. You are getting something that's a huge departure from Final Fantasy. Uh, you, you, I'm sure everyone here knows that. But if you're still on the fence, I do recommend it. But just know that you are getting a Final Fantasy Devil May Cry Lite. Right? There's still Final Fantasy elements, but they're really in the narrative. And the combat's much closer to something as of like a Kingdom Hearts, honestly. That's kind of the closest combat equal, I would say. is actually Kingdom Hearts. A lot, I know a lot of people say, you know, the Devil May Cry the head of oh what was he on oh my god uh the game one of the gameplay designers i believe like head gameplay designer was from devil may cry 5 and although you see a little bit of it it's not much i mean devil may cry is incredibly complicated especially when you really delve into those combos and you're not doing anywhere touching that sort of depth in this game it's a very very different things i think it's actually way 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 closer to kingdom hearts specifically three a little bit of two in certain ways but it is it, it's kind of a unique thing i don't think it's really like anything else because of what it does with certain aspects of the game but i do recommend it. i think everyone should at least give it a shot especially if you like final fantasy if you've ever liked a final fantasy you'll like it if you like combat games i think you should give it a shot and again the narrative is very very good although it takes some turns near the end that i didn't quite love i wanted it to take a couple other turns but in the end i was satisfied with the game and I'm going to be trying for the Platinum. Let's see if I will keep that up, because you have to play it twice, one on the regular mode, and then you get a Final Fantasy mode that makes the game slightly harder. So I'm just playing through that, and I'll be finishing up with that. I'm playing a little bit of Destiny as well, like always. Uh, I think that's about it from like everything I wanted to say. Remnant 2, of course, enjoying that. Enjoying that, actually, incredibly deeply. It's something that came out of really nowhere for me. I know a lot of people out there are actually fans of the series, especially with the first game. They were already I remember people already saying they kind of liked the first one, but this second one really kind of, I feel like, pulls out all the stops. Reminds me of what I'm seeing from actually Lords of the Fallen. I, th I think that's how you say it. Lords of the Fallen instead of Lords of Fallen. Kind of a sequel, sort of, not really, but it reminds me of what I'm seeing of that, where they're really taking the, the the first part of that game and they're really expanding and showing off what they learned and making a really, really big push into the kind of game they've seen with these kind of unique interactions with, yeah, you know, it is this kind of game, but also it can be this like this as well. And we're going to have this different interpretation of what you would say a Souls like, but it's not really a Souls like. It's only a Souls like in these very few instances. It's kind of its own thing. And I think actually Remnant, uh, from the ashes 2 is, is actually a very good title especially if you're doing co-op i can't imagine loving this game honestly if it if i was just playing it by myself unless i really kind of got in the nitty-gritty of things um no spoilers but i did just get to level 10 and unlocked a specific thing which is very fun i can't wait to experiment with the new feature that you get when you get level 10 and kind of doing certain things with that but love it if you like to play something that is a fps taking a lot of the Souls-like elements into the game. Definitely Remnant from Ashes. Although I do wish the game was a bit prettier. It is very dreary and dull and dark. And and, and those things, I think, a lot of times are related to be bad things. Actually, I'm not saying it in a bad way. I just wish we had some differences in color uh, to really contrast these dark areas I keep going to. Maybe that's going to happen uh, soon. I've only been to, I think, about three or four worlds. Maybe I will find something that is like this kind of not it doesn't have to be super colorful, but it's just something that contrasts the very dark and dreary world that I find myself in. Because even the actual real world that you're in, in like the hub world is even kind of got this kind of gray textured down, no light, less, you know, a little less light, little things. So I'll be curious to see how this game plays out, too, because 
no one's talking about the story for this game. It's almost non-existent. It's it's like a thin line of of a fishing a fishing line through the game where it's just like there's a story. It's only to get you to A and B and C. Just keep doing it, and I'll be interested to see if I get excited or in depth with the story. Right now, it's pretty low bar, but we'll see. That's not what we'll even play. Let's talk with rumor roundup. Rumors about a discless Xbox Series X comes out of the Xbox Era podcast via Shepshul Nick. I, I hope I pronounced this right. She- Shepshul Nick, I think is how you pronounce his name. Um, and that's from the Xbox Era. Not much else has been said about anything else, but this sets X- uh, Microsoft up for maybe some sort of mid-gen refresh, possibly making the Series X smaller. And important to note from Insider Gaming that they apparently have heard that the rumblings of the next-gen consoles might not have discs at all. I find that interesting. I, I don't... I don't know if I am. I don't know if they dump so quickly into that. And also, what's there's no there's nothing wrong with having options at all. And they can also always have an, ex, an expandable disc reader, similar to what the PS5 is about to do right now. That's why you see some of the PS5s going to sale and in certain markets is they're trying to get rid of a lot of this uh, stock that they have, so they can really go in on. Hey, there's only the disc list, and you can buy this separate disc reader and attach it to your console if you'd like. But we're only going to be making this one from now on. And I think that's actually smart from a uh, manufacturing standpoint. You would always want that option. And I have no problem with them doing that from now on. Hey, you know, there's only a disc list. There's going to be one system for this one iteration of this console. But if you want to, here's a side thing that you can plug your thing in. You can play discs. No problem with that at all. I don't really mind. I only really play digital anymore anyways. I do collect some physical games um, from like the Xbox 360 era and PS2, but that's really about it. So I am a part of the digital era, whether I like it or not. I'm not buying physical, so I'm voting in some way. But um, I'll be curious to see how this, uh, if this comes to fruition, if this is to combat the PlayStation announcement, is this going to be gearing up for another uh, more powerful Xbox Series X and kind of like a, uh, in the middle of the generation, similar to what we've been hearing with PS5. I believe it was called Project Trinity is what it is. Uh, something like that. But uh, And, and I, this is important to note, actually, what, now that I bring this up, and a little bit of a tangent here, but um, apparently Phil Spencer looks at the Series X as the mid-gen refresh for the Xbox. I can't imagine he was being truthful. That was in an interview around... When was that? I think July? blanking on when it was but he basically went on the record talking to jeff grubb i think it was um on the giant bomb uh, cast thing uh and they're pretty he was pretty much like he sees the series x as that mid-gen refresh and the series s as the main unit and i find it hard to believe that they'll just seed an entire new console uh market to ps5 getting a much better beefier something that can run 4k 60 frames uh, more consistently with the newer games and they're just going to let PlayStation just run amok with that. I don't know. Maybe they can't make a new system for some reason or there is some sort of limitation with, from them for Microsoft that they won't or this is how they want to do it. But they might have already shot themselves in the foot for this generation. Again, I am, uh, as you all know, I am an Xbox fan, so I find it interesting that they are uh, enforcing the Series S uh, to also work with any game that launches on the Series X, which might hurt them in the long run. I don't know if if that's something they wish they could go back on or if they wish they could maybe amend in some way. I never knew when they announced the Series S and X that, or at least I should say I, I didn't know at the time, that this was going to be a parallel-like econ- econ- economy-ish e- ecosystem, I guess is a better way of putting it. Whereas the Series S is... is coexisting with the series x and there is no reality without one or the other i didn't think they would go so hard as like no if you buy a series s every game that comes on the series x will work on it i just i'm sure that was said at the time but that just never hit me until right now where i'm seeing a game we're going to talk about a little bit later Baldur's gate 3 from larian studios their whole reason for not launching on xbox is they can't get it to work there's a specific split screen thing i believe that they wanted to do in their mode and it just won't run on a series s hopefully i don't butcher that i'm pretty sure that's the reason and that's that's why they're not launching on it and 
frankly, it's a pretty good reason. If you can't get it to work on the Series X, you can't launch on the Series X. And I really do think that might have been an error in judgment because you can't make that sort of rule when you're in last place, as they like to remind us. Uh, especially with the Activision Blizzard case that they like to remind, hey, we know we're in last place. Blah, blah, blah. Well, maybe PlayStation could have gotten away with that where, hey, uh, if you say no to us, you're going to lose, uh, let's say, an installment of like 50 million people or something like that. Or, you know, or I should say 40 million people uh, as what they've uh, about to, they're going to sell through very soon. Uh, that's nothing to sniff at, and that's a lot of a market value that or market share that would just you just have to ignore and just go solely into PC slash Xbox if if you ignore them. But with Xbox, you might they might be set being sold two to one. So let's say they're they're selling about half of that twenty million ish. That's not good, and with revenue down and them not going into uh uh their actual console sales down their actual revenue meaning their their console sales are down that's very bad that is that's showing that they're not only losing market share they're not gaining in any way in this current generation so you i just don't think they were in that position to broadly broadly proclaim no you have to make it for this thing get it to work or you're going to lose out on this do they really care that much boulders gate show, shows that some publishers that won't they won't and they don't care and they're not going to spend the extra dev time and money to try and make it to Xbox, especially when it is already an obstacle that you must overcome to even get there in the first place. I would love to know everyone's thoughts out there on everything I just said. What do you think about the Series S and X and the kind of polar but parallel projections that they're having currently? And is this something we're going to see more and more? Is this going to be a problem in the Xbox ecosystem? Is this going to be something that is a arbiter of what's to come let's say uh pun intended uh that right now we're seeing one to two games miss maybe there's gonna be something else maybe we're gonna start missing more and more games boulder skate 3 might be game of the year and that's an in and that is a title that they're gonna might be that they will miss out on if there is no sort of compromise in this situation and they're just going to go a whole year without a big name game on their platform that just seems silly frankly but maybe i'm thinking too narrowly maybe they don't care maybe they're sitting on on pc like well you know we love xbox but we were already getting them on pc so we maybe don't care but that's to steam but obviously steam has to pay to like host on windows so i don't know there's so many interesting caveats to these things that you can really think about i'd love to again hear anyone's thoughts out there make sure okay comment below if you'd like you can tweet at me of course on uh twitter i refuse to call it x because it's a little silly so i'm still going to be calling it twitter until at some point it doesn't sound silly to say x x me Ubisoft has canceled its Immortal Phoenix Rising sequel. This is over by Andy Robinson. There's not much to say here. Uh, his sources are telling him uh, that the sequel has been canceled. There was one in the works. Uh, there was an update to the story, if you actually read it uh, in earlier in that week that it came out, according to, uh, and this is just from his, of course, write-up. That's according to multiple development sources who told VGC Anomaly that the follow-up game was in early development at Ubisoft Quebec, but company leadership ultimately decided to cancel it earlier this month due to perceived challenges around establishing the IP. And here's the update. Ubisoft has responded to the story and said it's, quote, reallocating some creative teams and resources within the Quebec studio. And as part of our global strategy, we're redirecting and reallocating some creative studios and resources with the Quebec studios to other unannounced projects. The expertise and technologies these teams develop will serve as an accelerator for the development of these key projects focused on our biggest brands. We have nothing further to share at this time, end quote. Now, I think you can kind of read between the lines in there. A World Phoenix Rising was canceled in order to fund something more important to Ubisoft. Now, next up in the record and next up in uh, the notes here for the show, every Assassin's Creed currently in development. There are over 11. This is uh, from a actually I found this on Reddit. This is someone just someone made. And I thought this was a great thing to just go over. This is uh, by this is Gaming Leaks and Rumor by Zombie Nerd 300. And they made this list. And I was like, you know what? This is a great thing to cover on the show. And I'm going to. 
So I brought it up here, and this is everything currently uh, announced we know about pretty much. Well, it's been leaked in some way, and we can pretty confident say. So there's over 11 Assassin's Creed games currently in development. Let's start. Assassin's Creed Mirage. This is uh, going to be coming out October 12th. Assassin's Creed Nexus. That's, of course, the VR project that's coming out sometime this year. Uh, Assassin's Creed Codename Jade. That's the mobile game. That's sometime this year. Assassin's Creed Codename Red. That's going to be sometime maybe next year from certain sources. Codename Hex. That is sometime in 2025 to 2026. Codename Invictus. This is a multiplayer game sometime 25, 26. Nebula. This is a single player game. This is concept prototype. Both of all three. Everything else is unknown in time frame when it's released. So we're just going to quickly go through these. So that's a single player game. Codename Raid. This is a multiplayer game. Codename Echoes. This is also a multiplayer game. Codename Nexus 2 VR. This is only being discussed. So this is probably not even pre pro, not even concept. This is before they even put pen to paper a potential sequel to the vr uh game and then the black flag remake which was just greenlit apparently uh w which we saw sources from i want to say vgc two weeks ago three weeks ago said that that, that existed uh, and that that just hit greenlit so that means that they're going to begin working on that that could come as soon as 2025 2026 depending on how big the remake is uh, who knows how deep the wheel is if it's a full rework that might uh, we might not see the light of day until 26 27 at the latest or earliest then uh, but i thought that was interesting and i think that it's clear where that creative team is going right they're going to some of this they might be split up to work at some things they they said it was in um hold on let me double check before, uh, before i spout this they, they said it says unannounced projects that means nothing to us because we know a lot of their stuff so could be to multiple assassin's creed games could be uh helming things who knows if they might not be helming anything they might be just cooperating with other ubisoft studios it might be a, a group effort between ubisoft studios to make more assassin's creed games maybe it's something else like the rumored Splinter Cell game that they we keep hearing about, but I, I at this point I'll see it when it's out in my hands. I refuse to believe it, it exists. But they have quadrupled. They have not even quadrupled. They've like quintupled to multiple times down on Assassin's Creed. We are seeing a Ubisoft that is going back to the basics. They have done this before. Let's see if we can do it again. We're going to just go back, see if we can make some money on just making Assassin's Creed over and over again. They again, they tried this. If you remember, in like the three, uh, the end of the 360, going into the Xbox One, kind of mid Xbox One generation where they just kept releasing ones and they just kept getting worse because they just didn't have enough time. They kept coming out worse, worse, worse. Ending with Unity pretty much in Syndicate. Uh, Unity was kind of the the last domino that hit that like was the uh, kind of worst one out of the whole bunch. And then Syndicate came out and no one bought it because Assassin's Creed was kind of played out. So they abandoned it and went full-fledged into making these kind of trilogies that were set in like the far flung past but still was connected to the universe so we'll see how that kind of plays out i'll be curious uh to see what ubisoft looks like in five to six to, to a decade if this pans out because i'll say it again they tried this didn't work last time maybe it works for them this time i don't know but they're slowly becoming the the Assassin's Creed publisher, especially with that many projects in the works. I don't know this website. So this is X Fire, I think. Is that what is that how you say this? Yeah, X Fire. Wow, just a silly name. But let's talk about it. So this is by Ray. Oh my God, I'm sorry if I butchered this. Apolicio, Apoculo. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Apparently, there's a remake for Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion at development at Virtuous Games. Now, if that sounds familiar, we did cover many, 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 many months ago that they were actually leaked from a former employee's LinkedIn page that they were working on a remake for Metal Gear Solid 3 that was just confirmed a couple months ago uh, during Jeff Keighley's little thing, uh, uh, Summer Games Fest, that he does. Uh, that was finally confirmed that they were doing a Metal Gear Solid 3 thing. There it is right there. We, we So we know that there is some sort of validity to these things. 
And then, of course, we hear that apparently there's going to be a remake for Oblivion coming very soon. Now, this uh, comes the way of a since deleted post on Reddit uh, that says a couple things. Now, it doesn't exist anymore, so I can't find it. But it was included in the article that I can read from here. So this is from... I'm not going to read that because I don't want to be... I don't want like YouTube to not recommend me. You can look up what the name of the user is. It's deleted, so it doesn't matter anyways. This is a rumor. So this says as of, quote, I am an ex-employee of the company, Virtuous, uh, Virtuous Games Paris is what it says, by the way. And here are some projects that they're working on. Sadly, I couldn't take any screenshots or whatever to exactly prove my words. But well, first, there's an there's, quote, alter project, end quote, uh, which is the remaster remake of Oblivion. The discussion for it being a full remake are still ongoing. It is done currently using a pairing system. So it means that the remaster is running using both an Unreal Engine 5 project and the old Oblivion one. For instance, new graphics are rendered in the Unreal Engine 5 engine, uh, Unreal Engine 5 project, but most of the gameplay, physics, etc. is still done in Oblivion. It should be released at the end of next year, early 2025, depending mostly on if it's a remake or remaster. It's mostly done in Paris, but Black Shamrock also helps the studio for the art. Then you have the internal project called Massive. This is for now in a really in an early step, but it has the ambition of becoming a, AAA, a big AAA project. This is basically Monster Hunter X Shadow of the Colossus. They have big bosses and things. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but you get the idea. Another project is Karoba, which is a remaster remake. Not sure what stage of Metal Gear Solid 3. We know about that one. And then they're also working on an X. Extension for New World, Amazon's MMO, by first working on the next DLC before taking a complete one on their own. Uh, and they also edited it and said, I forgot one called Omnis. This is a narrative climbing game. Again, quite early in the process, searching for an editor currently. So we can believe them or not. Who knows if that any of that's real? We have seen links from them prior. It's deleted now and the user's deleted now. So maybe that adds weight to it. Who knows? I don't know how to really take it as... It really is just kind of a person talking about this. So we'll have to see if any of that becomes a free witching. Uh, uh, but the, apparently they did. Uh, let's see. So while we so this is from the X fire. So while we recommend that you take most of this with a grain of salt, a mod from Gaming Links Room is subreddit verified the immersion of the source, proving that he is a former employee of Virtuous Studios. So apparently if we trust the mods of that Reddit, apparently it's true. Just kind of take everyone by the storm. So let's actually start the show for the week. This is Nintendo is targeting 2024 with their next-gen consoles. This is by VGC. There's not too much here. They they pretty much hear that there's key partners are telling them to expect um, a 2024 next-gen Nintendo console early in the year. So uh, this is via straight from their article by Andy Robinson yet again, according to multiple people with knowledge of Nintendo's next gen console plans, the company is likely to release new hardware during the second half of 2024 to ensure that it has ample stock available on day one and to avoid the kind of shortages seen with PlayStation five and Xbox series S and X. Although specific details of this console are being kept closely guarded. There's those of the G spoke to a Denny uh, in, indicated that the next gen console would be able to be used in a portable mode. Of course, just like the Nintendo switch, Two sources spoke to suggested that the console would launch with an LCD screen instead of a more premium OLED screen to bring down costs, especially considering the increased storage needed for high fidelity, higher fidelity games. The current Switch games with just 32 gigabytes of internal memory, while many uh, games are over 100 gigs, so apparently they are offsetting the cost of more of a OLED screen by not including that, going with an LCD screen, and just going with more storage, which is probably wise because. It does keep the cost down and it will n keep people from feeling like, oh, you know, it's not really this. You have to buy a thing with this. So, so it's not really that much. But I would love the option of both. We'll discuss that in a second. Other details such as backwards compatibility support for Switch games, physical and digital remain unclear. Nintendo says it wants to convert as many of Switch 100 million uh, plus a user base as possible to its next system. Although some third party publishers just to have expressed concern that legacy support or Switch games could negatively affect sales of next-gen consoles. Of course, Nintendo didn't respond for comment. That's really all I wanted to bring up from this specific story. There's actually more here. I don't want to read all this because it's actually a great piece that everyone should go check out. I don't like just regurgitating 
an entire article to you. So just go check out VGC, of course, Andy Robinson's piece on Nintendo Targets 2024 with next-gen console. Now that we have that out of the way, let's just discuss some of the findings. One, LCD screen. I'm honestly not too surprised. I didn't expect it to, to launch with an OLED screen because what does Nintendo love doing? Let's just think, what, what do they love to do? All right, let's think of the 3DS. How many times was a 3DS put in your face? They had the 3DS, the new 3DS, 3DS XLs, new 3DS XLs, 2DS, 2D XLs, new 2D XLs. Like the, the amount of DS, you know, DS, DS Lite. So it comes to the point, DS Lite, it comes to the point at, I, I, I see Nintendo as being like, you know, that's an easy resell. We, we sell them now. We get them to buy all of our stock. And then, boom, now it's switched to OLED model. We sell them all those. I mean, this is just how Nintendo works. They love trying to get you to buy this console more than once. And how many of us have done that? I have. Now, uh, technically, I sold my Switch to get an upgrade to the OLED Switch. So, you know, it's a little different, but I'm definitely one of the people who buy them multiple times. I had to buy an extra one for the wife. You know, you buy more than one usually per household. I'm sure people average two a household. If you if you are buying a Switch, you sometimes are buying more than one because... Maybe you're buying it for a kid or the adults also want to play it while the kids play. So they buy two, one for the other one, you know, it, so much stuff. And then the Switch Lite comes into play with the more cheaper models. So they love making new models. They love reselling you similar models with slight upgrades or downgrades to like help uh, fix things like cost. And so, of course, why the Switch Lite existed. It was just a handheld. It's cheaper. It does not connect to a dock. You can just play it like this. Or, you know, and you had almost like a ladder. Like, you know, if you want a Switch, you can go with this. If you want to Switch OLED, here's this. And I'm sure that will be something that they do as well. Hey, let's launch with, let's not run into, because you, you have that one chance to get a lot of people at once, right? So have as much stock as available as possible. Let's launch when we have a back stock ready to go. We go second half of the year. We throw it all in the market boom we're done wait a year we're sold through we're we're making as fast as we're selling here's the new model switch to light boom do it again six months later switch let oled or whatever boom keep going keep going that's just how nintendo is they love doing that stuff that makes them an incredible dumb amount of money so who's to blame them that's really all i have really to discuss specifically about the new system um I will say we're about to talk about backwards compatibility, so that you know, I'm not ignoring that factor that was brought up. We're going to talk that in a second uh, with a very high-ranking CEO that discussed about the game. But Nintendo is one of the companies where it's just difficult to discern what they're going to do, right? People, to you and me, and many people probably like, well, of course, Switch Two will be portable, and you know, Nintendo does what they want. No one knew they wanted the Wii until they made it, right? This is how we're. De this is who we're dealing with. Nintendo has been at this for a very long time. Some of them, some of them have been there since Nintendo has become relevant. Still, I believe a uh, good bit of them actually are still there. I mean, people like Shigeru Miyamoto, people with knowledge of the industry. That's why they've got the sauce, you know. That's why they're they're there on the sidelines. People think they're in a different market. I refuse. To accept that they are in the exact same market that xbox and playstation do they just do it differently and frankly they do it smarter than probably both of them although i think someone who is on the outside would be like you know playstation's the most dominant uh because they throw it in your face a lot i think i think playstation's very good at uh flexing their name a lot more than nintendo is nintendo will do a direct They'll do it. They'll tell you about it a day before. They'll have a cool direct, and then they're gone for six months. Then they'll have another direct, but that one's not as good. So yeah, you know. so they don't really flex, I think, as much. But if you really put bare bones to bare bones, Nintendo, I think, is the leader in this market, frankly, uh, because they just know what they're doing. They're they're very premium. I don't know why no one's stolen what makes them so much money and profit and revenue and how they like. When you see a $60 Nintendo game, you know it's not getting cheaper. And I'm so shocked PlayStation hasn't taken that to some account where, you know, hey, our games will be 60 bucks the first year, the second year will be 50 the third year will be 40 something if they're too scared to make the jump to Nintendo. 
something like this. It just never goes down in price. I'm, I'm just shocked that they don't attempt to do something similar to that. They're, like right now, I'm sh I wouldn't be shocked if there's somewhere right now that The Last of Us Part 2 is on sale for $15. Like That's wild, but at that point, are you even making money that matters to you as PlayStation? Right To us, that's a lot of money, but to PlayStation, do they even care if they when they make last of us part two, 15 bucks and they sell another 2 million units. Do they even care about that amount of profit that they made? I don't know. And I guess at the end of the day, you're in the black. So it's just free money at that point. If, if you're in the black, who cares how much extra money? If you go, you know, that's how a lot of people think, Hey, we're in the black. We made our money back. We've already made our expected profit slash revenue from this. I don't care. Make it ten dollars and have it sell as much as its lifespan will go. Keep keep pushing, keep pushing. But I don't know. PlayStation's so good at getting people to their marketplace that you would think you would always want to get them on a sixty dollars price, and then that incentivizes people to go with PlayStation uh, Extra Premium, you know, plus all these essential. Sorry, uh, that incentivizes them more to adapt to to that. So I feel like it's a win win. But of course, I'm not an economist or economist. Not someone that's very smart with the actual dollars of this industry. Maybe there's something I'm missing. Stress Elnick had to sit down with Games Industry Up is. Man, a lot of people upset, but I believe he is saying something much more here than others are picking up. So what did the Take Two CEO say? Pretty much detailing the pros and cons of making the next Nintendo console backwards compatible. Let's read some quotes. Quote. You need to give consumers what they want and optimize their experience. And you can't not deliver a feature you're able to deliver so as to maximize sales. This isn't fulfilling your contract with consumers. You have to do the very best you can for them. I suppose it's possible the lack of backwards compatibility could enhance your revenue for a period of time, but at what costs? We're not a hardware manufacturer, so we don't get to make those decisions. But I think if you could be a compatible, if you can be compatible technically, than you want to be. However, in certain instances, if the leap forward is great enough, that it's not a possibility, end quote. I thought this was very interesting to read in conclusion to the Nintendo targets and uh, uh, certain people saying certain third parties don't want backwards compatibility because they want to resell you the games. That is interesting uh, timing for all these things. We get that there. Then we go to the Strazonic. Now, that's why I did this very purposely because we get... A side of the coin and another side of the coin. So he's giving you the pros and cons. And I did see a lot of people kind of upset about some of these quotes over the internet. I think they weren't really reading, unfortunately, what was actually said. Uh, he's just giving points that would give you insight on why you would go one way or the other, right? If you don't go backwards compatible, you might be breaking a, he, as he says, contract. I'm curious if that is some sort of lingo that he regularly uses in kind of the way he sees this business. But that would break like this contract that we kind of have that 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 we all understand that the games that we buy right now are going to kind of follow with us in like this new digital era. And once you kind of break that, it's hard to maybe regain that trust, right? 360 ps3 era might be the very last time we ever see this ever again it's very possible that that's a reality because we're now in this digital era where everything can live on these kind of servers everything has a license everything's entitled to a account or person and with that new reality comes to the expectation that i will live here for the foreseeable future that's why it's so hard to keep someone from one system to the other because we've all kind of made a home where we are, right? Uh, I'm a little more agnostic than most, but let's say there's a mom and pop or, or maybe a uh, like a teenager out there that wants the next Xbox, but you've been on PlayStation for so long, you're going to lose countless games that you've bought over the years. That just becomes so, so... That, that by itself is such a big decision maker that it de incentivize people to go to the other side in quotes right and i don't blame anyone right i could not imagine a place where i have to leave xbox because i hit i have so much history there i have so many achievements i have memories there i have all these games i mean i might have 600 plus games something like that entitled to to my account so like if i just leave Oh, that's gone. That's insane, right? 
So it really de incentivizes anyone to do any of that again, right? And I find myself in the position of maybe saying something that's obvious to other people, but once Nintendo's part of this ecosystem, like I said earlier, in the market, I don't think you're you can be bold enough to say, hey, this next Switch isn't it's not backwards compatible. I don't think you can do it. I maybe Nintendo would get away with it because it is Nintendo, but I think that reality is just so far gone from most people's head. When they buy a Switch now, I really do believe that they expect it to work on the next Switch. But at the same time, Nintendo is that company that if they made you rebuy it, I think people would. Which is strange to say. It's almost I'm almost arguing myself here. I apologize if this is long winded or silly at home, but Nintendo does really kind of feel like that company that, hey, uh, y- y- nothing you have now matters. Uh, we'll keep the Switch going for a little bit, but this is the new platform. Uh, nothing works on the on this platform. Uh, you have to rebuy things. Uh, sorry. I don't know. Do they have that many disgruntled people? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe some people would swear off the platform and say, hey, you know, I'm done. But no one really does what Nintendo does anymore. PlayStation tried. They exited the market as fast as they entered it. With the handheld space, with Vita and these things, they tried. The PSP, of course, phenomenal system. They tried. They entered. They didn't like what they were seeing, and they left. They couldn't do it. They couldn't figure it out. So who is that person that you would leave the Nintendo? It's almost kind of like a micro monopoly inside of this not monopoly, right? And of course, monopoly isn't the right word, but you understand what I'm trying to get at here that, hey, you utilizing the fan base that we have, we could manipulate it to a point where, hey, we boost our long our shirt to long term sales of our platform. That means a bigger cut to us. That means more money for us. That means they have to rebuy all these games, et cetera, et cetera. Or you go with the consumer plus route of, hey, we get it. You don't have to rebuy any of your games. If you bought them digitally, it all works. The physical thing is what I'm interested in. If you buy them digitally, maybe they all go with you. But what if they don't include that little micro SD card to read it? I'm assuming they're going to stick with the micro kind of SD card storage type thing that they're doing right now. Because I've just heard that it's actually better than discs now. I don't know if that's true. Or maybe there's a new technology that's doing that that I don't understand. I'm not very, I'm not that tech minded. I I like to think I know tech a little bit. But that specifically, I don't quite understand. But I'm pretty sure I, I thought I heard that that that's like able to store more so they might stick with that i don't know but i don't think we see them back at discs so maybe they just stick with this method of using it and they use like some sort of cloud system to to like boost uh how they play certain things i I don't know i don't know but i thought these were all interesting things especially hearing from someone as smart as strauss acting zelnick and i love how chatty strauss acting like is i feel like not many ceos you get this much uh i feel like i'm covering him every other month because he's he said something to yahoo or these things like it's very cool i like it this is a quick one i just wanted to bring this up square enix is bringing final fantasy 14 to xbox i love this sometime spring 2024 uh final fantasy 14 of course a giant mmo uh, I'm right now I'm looking at a picture of all of them like whole like uh, shaking hands like they're all in the pool with Phil Spencer and the director, of course, uh, and the Square Enix CEO. Love it. And this is kind of hinting that uh, and Phil Spencer says, quote, we look forward to building on the relationship that we've established and bringing Final Fantasy 14 to Xbox and partnering closely with you and the Square Enix team on future games. Kind of hinting like, hey, uh, this isn't it. I'm done with not having Square on our side. Maybe there's something has changed in the waters that maybe gets Xbox in the good graces of Square. I can't imagine what that would be, honestly, uh, because they are pretty much ignorable if you are a Square Enix because a lot of their base is on PlayStation and they really care about the Japanese market, although they make more money, I believe, in America. They still care about the Japanese market and Xbox is still kind of a joke in the xbox market still to this day shockingly they just cannot figure out how to penetrate that market like nintendo and playstation ads i think they just have like vice grip on the market that they just can't and i think a lot of playstation's moves of exclusivity have ensured that xbox cannot move into their market in that specific way maybe i'm thinking too 
conspiratorial here, but I'm thinking that maybe a lot of these kind of exclusivity deals that they hit are to keep Xbox from grabbing a market that they know they have a chokehold on. So they ensure that that market is not moving anywhere. They are not experiencing Xbox or Game Pass or these things. Like they're not letting them leave that ecosystem. Specifically, of course, Final Fantasy VII being that kind of big example, right? We knew that uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake had a year exclusivity, I believe. It was a year or two years. Uh, anyways, it had an exclusivity date. Once it passed it, it didn't come to Xbox. Then we hear Rebirth is coming only the PlayStation, but Crisis Core remake didn't. So it looks like they have the mainline ones and they got Final Fantasy 16. So it looks like they had some sort of giant deal that probably cost a lot of money that that secures Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth, Final Fantasy 16. And of course, my tinfoil hat theory of, hey, also, you have to get uh, Foam Stars and these other crappy games that we have that we have no home for. We know they're not going to probably go very well in the market, so you still have to make your plus session blogs. You still have to put them in state of plays because that's how these games are going to live. So that's a part of the deal or no deal. And I imagine that's how it went, and I can't imagine how much money PlayStation had to pay for to lock all this down. I, I mean, if I had to guess, we're talking $500 million, maybe $300 million to completely lock out maybe that's too high but for but to lock all that down 16 7 and 7 rebirth and potentially the third game in the trilogy um reunion uh and all that like i mean that that's a lot of that that's that's a lot of cash so i can't imagine how much money that was and that's the news for the week let's go up to date updates Pokemon Scarlet and Violet's first part of their DLC, The Hidden Treasure of Area Zero Part 1, The Teal Mask, <laughs> launches September 13th. WrestleQuest has been delayed to August 22nd at the 11th hour. Very strange. I don't... They had a, tw a Twitter post uh, detailing that they had um, some sort of... Oh, they said what, what the issue was. I don't remember now. It's not important. But they had an issue that they discovered. Oh, uh, a, 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 sa a save... Uh a save bug that would eat your save if something happened to like well we're delaying this and we can't launch it like this good for them that definitely cost them money so that shows a level of respect they have for their customers that is pretty rare because a lot of companies would have just released it let's be honest Killer Instinct is randomly getting a 10th anniversary update due out later this year. Kind of cool. I like that. I liked Killer Instinct. It was uh, one of those, you know, you didn't have anything else to play, so let's play this on the original Xbox One when it launched. Happy to see it. Red Dead Redemption 2 is coming P to PS4 and Switch August 17th for $49.99. Now, you're asking yourself, why isn't this on Xbox? If you asked yourself that when you saw these announcements, there's a few reasons. One, it never launched on Switch, so that's why it's going there. Two, it's on PlayStation because it's not backwards compatible game. Uh, of course, Red Dead Redemption 1, a PS3 game. Uh, they do not offer any sort of backwards compatibility natively. Uh, you have to like pay for premium and then stream PS3 games. That's the only way to play Red Dead 1, and I don't even remember if it's on that. I don't think it is. Another reason why it's not launching on Xbox is there's already a arguably better version currently. So if there's if you had the Xbox 360 either on disc or digital, you can just play Red Dead Redemption right now. And it's might be better than this port. As far as what I've seen, uh, you can play at 4K. You can play it at 60 frames, all enhanced for free with quick resume and all these other features that Xbox has. Boom, right now on your Xbox. Whereas PS4 and Switch, first off, Switch, I don't blame them for releasing on Switch. That's a that's a thing that is there. PS4 kind of sucks. Still haven't figured out PS3 back with Scarlet Duty. Very strange. Uh, so it seems like Xbox, like, why are you being left out? And then you think about it, it's like, oh, because this would look worse in comparison to the backwards compatibility that was done for free. For free. <clears throat> no additional cost. It just works better now. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, we're about to get into Game Pass. I need some water as I've been talking for 49 minutes straight. It's a nice water break, everyone. Now. Whenever I see them, I update you on both Game Pass and Xbox. 
Oh, restart. Whenever I see them, I update you on Xbox Game Pass editions, as well as what's leaving the service. And of course, I update you on PlayStation Plus and Premium and all these things. So let's talk about that. Let's start with Game Pass. Starting available already as of recording, Celeste, an incredible game that everyone must attempt at least once. I would love for everyone listening to the show. It's on cloud console and PC. So any Game Pass that you use is available. Please give this a shot. I am not a 2D platformer guy. I am not a fan of them very much at all. They have to be very good for me to care about them at all. This is one of the best games I have played in the last couple years. I very, very much, very much recommend this game to you. Now, this is everything still live as of this recording. A short hike. Hike. A short hike. I remember seeing this somewhere. I think you're a bird. Enjoy. Bro Force Forever, Cloud Console PC, August 8th, so available as of recording. I don't know if you all remember the first Bro Force. It was just dumb fun. Very Contra. You run and gun. You're, you're, you, uh, you play exaggerated versions of, um, how do I put this? Like, 80s action hero, but they always had, like, a fun name. Like, Sylvester Stallone was, like, Kilvester, um... Bane loan or something in that that wasn't his name, but that's my shitty version. I'm trying to tell you what it sounded like, but that is a great game pass grab. I cannot wait to play this. Cannot wait. Limbo call console and PC, an incredible game that I hope everyone plays. That was a 360 game on Xbox Live Arcade. Never forget that Airborne Kingdom cloud console and PC available now available August 15th. Everspace 2 Cloud and Xbox Series S and X. It's already available on PC, and this is it coming to consoles. Everspace 2. And that's it. That's everything coming, and this is everything leaving August 15th. Death Stranding for PC. Edge of Eternity, Cloud Console and PC. Midnight Flight Express, Cloud Console and PC. Total War Warhammer 3, PC. Of course, you can snag your 20% off if you would like to purchase it before it leaves. Now let's go to PlayStation Extra and Premium. All games listed will be available from August 15th, with the exception of Sea of Stars, of course. Sea of Stars is going to be August 29th. That is a game that's launching day and date with both PlayStation Plus Premium and Game Pass. That's very interesting, and I believe it is the first game of its kind, although I'm sure there was another game before this. I feel like this is kind of the first game, at least of the of the caliber that Sea of Stars is, that it is launching on both consoles on both subscriptions. Very interesting. I'll keep an eye out. See how this performs. So this is everything for PlayStation uh, Plus Extra and Premium. Sea of Stars, PS4, PS5, moving out to PS4, PS5. Uh, Destiny 2, The Witch Queen. Very cool. Uh, Lost Judgment, Destroy All Humans Reprobed, Two Point Hospital Jumbo Edition, that's only for PS4. Source of Madness, Curse the Gulf Dreams, only for PS4. Uh, it's only a PS4 title, so it's not only for PS4. Do you understand what I mean? Page, PJ Ma Masks, Heroes of the Night, Hotel Transylvania, Scary Tale Adventures, Lawn Mowing Simulator, Lawn Mark Edition, Spur Force 3, Rio Force, that's only a PS4 title, and Midnight Fight Express, that's only a PS4 title. Uh, and again, you can play this on your PS5, but it will only be a PS4 game. It won't be. It will not be listed as a PS5 game. PlayStation Plus Premium Classics. This is only for classics. Uh, sorry, this is only for premium. Medieval Resurrection, Ape Escape on the Loose, Pursuit Force Extreme Justice. Those are all PSP games. Very happy to see more PSP games added to premium. Hopefully, this gets a little more enticing because one day I would like to delve into the service, really get to uh, playing some games that are added to this, but. As of right now, still not enough for me to really jump in. But remember, everything I listed before was both extra and premium, of course. And then those last three were only premium titles. And that's day of day for the week. Let's get into what's queued. Now, this is everything that has been queued up for the weekend. This is, of course, a question to ask both myself and you at home. What do you have queued up for the weekend? This, of course, be a game, a podcast, a movie, a TV show, a book, a comic book, anything under the sun. I want you to tell me what... Do you have Keto for the weekend? Now, I am going to be continuing my Final Fantasy 16 Platinum, of course. Two trophies exist between me and that sweet, sweet Platinum. Of course, that is beat Final Fantasy mode and get every ability mastered in the game. So you have to get and master every ability via ability points. 
going to be a bit laborious because apparently if you beat the game, that's not enough ability points, so you have to go farm it from these things. And it's going to suck, but it will be done, and I'm very excited for that to be done because that is another platinum for the trophy collection. Aside from that, it will be, just like always, more Destiny 2, just going in, doing certain things to prep for the new raid that will be coming soon. Of course, August 22nd is a very exciting date as that will be the showcase for Final Shape, the last expansion in the Destiny 2 Light and Dark Saga. We will see how everything kind of plays out over that expansion. That's very exciting. I will be doing a Reacts to Destiny 2 uh, showcase on the channel, so be on the lookout for that. And I did actually do a State of the Game Reacts as well that you can go check out if you would like. Currently live on the channel right now. That's everything I have queued up. More Remnant and the Ashes. I've been playing that with ex-co-host Alex. A uh, very fun time with him. And that is really it. That's it. Thank you so much for joining me this week. This has been fun. I feel like we had a pretty good discussion, especially in the beginning of the show. I, I really enjoyed um our discussion about uh, Xbox Series X, the reality of Series S and X, and how that might play into each other. And we didn't even talk about what I wanted to talk about, of course. With Bowler's Gate and Bioware, let's switch that to its own video. How's that sound? We're going to make our own video about the realities of Bowler's Gate 3 and a little sneak peek, a little preview. Bowler's Gate 3 being the new Dragon Age slash Bioware. It seems that Bioware might have lost its kind of edge. And it seems like someone else is picking it up, of course, in Larian Studios. And there's going to be some interesting topics that we'll cover on that show, of course. I cannot wait for that to come to PlayStation as I will be playing it the moment it launches. Thank you so much for joining me this week. I have been Elijah. Thank you. I never outroed this show like that before. I always just say go chief, right? That's how I always do it, but maybe that was something different. That was I didn't plan that. That was like granular. Like, oh, thanks for joining me. I'm playing yeah. uh, How would I have outro this show? I guess it's just go chief.